I'd like to call on Deacon Gretchen Peterson for our opening prayer for this session. Gretchen. Thank you. Our opening prayer is called A Psalm of Possibility, written by Reverend Gail Song Bantam from a book called A Rhythm of Prayer, edited by Sarah Bessie. Let us pray. God, creator, hoverer, you speak and we form. You breathe life and we awake. You said it is good and we believe. God, the Red Sea before us shouting impossibility. They say we can't, we shouldn't, and we wouldn't. Words seeded from our youth, the limits and the lies. There must be truer truths in us to confound, resist, defy. Created from nothing, said something, made everything, this God. The Lord will fight for us, so we need only to be still. Still our soul, stand out loud, trusting that God is El Roy, God who sees, bears witness to a name. At her sound, leaps, demands possibility. Emmanuel, God with us, for us, within us. God, you said it is good, and we believe. You breathe life, and we awake. You speak, and we form. Creator, hoverer, God. A reading from Psalm 104, taking from taken from the inclusive Bible. From your palace, you water the highlands until the ground is sated by the fruit of your work. You make fresh grass grow for cattle and plants for us to cultivate, to get food from the soil, wine to cheer our hearts, oil to make our faces shine and bread to sustain our life. The trees of Yahweh drink their fill those cedars of Lebanon, where birds build their nests and on the highest branches, the stork makes its home. For the wild goats, there are the high mountains and in the crags, the rock badgers hide. You made the moon to tell the seasons and the sun knows when to set. You bring darkness on, night falls and all the forest animals come out. Savage lions roaring for their prey, claiming their food from God. The sun rises, they retire, going back to lie down in their lairs, and people go out to work, to labor again until evening. <coughs> Yahweh, what variety you have created, arranging everything so wisely. The earth is filled with your creativity. Let us pray. God of creation, thank you for all that you have made, for the stunning diversity of humankind, for the beauty of every flower head, the abundance of a healthy harvest. Help us to tread lightly and live wisely, remembering our place in the great web of creation. Challenge us where we need to change our lifestyles. Convict us when we need to speak out to amplify the voices of those who are so often ignored. Give us the courage to speak truth to power. Send us out to play our part in your world, in your work of restoring your world, healing broken relationships, working for justice, and loving all people. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Gretchen. I'm going to call on the Chair of the Elections Committee for the results of the first ballot for Vice Chair. Lynn, please come forward. <clears throat> Let me just explain what the process is going to be in the next, next little while. Lynn is going to read the uh, results. Those have already be, been shared with you, pushed out in uh, an email to all delegates and put in the, the um, documents section. Um, if you haven't seen it, you'll now see it, but I want to give you some time to reflect. So after Lynn has um, 
announce the results. We're going to take three minutes for you to prayerfully consider the results and to start thinking about how you might vote. We then will proceed to the second ballot if it's needed. <clears throat> and before voting, or when we vote, you will have two minutes to vote. So uh, people had asked for a little more clarity around time, and I'm giving it to you now. So here we go. Lynn, please. So on the first ballot for vice chair, there were 64 ballots cast. Uh, eight were spoiled. 56 were eligible, and so the votes needed to elect are 42. Uh, the votes were Bruce Cook, 10. Sheila Hamilton, 6. John Nilsson, 4. Lynn Slack, 3. Catherine Sewell Blazer, 2. Angela Chorney, 2. <coughs> Greg Lingelbach, 2. Pat Lovell, 2. Cheryl Bauer Hyde, 1. Kathy Bolstad, 1. Bev Corbett, 1. Rowan Diamond, 1. Linda Erlinson, 1. Bill Gastmeyer, 1. Rosine Gerhardt, 1. Linda Granger, 1. Stephen Holmes, 1. Heather Howdell, 1. Murray Jensen, 1. Kathleen Jensen, 1. Lori Kitchen, 1. Tim Lach, 1. Brian Lorch, 1. Tracy Middleholtz, 1. Sarah Pasco, 1. Deb Roberts, 1. Curtis Sater, 1. Philip Sigalette, 1. Russ Skakem, 1. Lori Scriver, 1. Joe Stoley, 1. Don Storch, 1. And Heidi Van Schaik, 1. Thank you very much, Lynn. You're welcome. So I invite you into three minutes of prayerful silence, and then we will proceed. I declare that there has been no election. We will need a second ballot.
Thank you all. We're now going to proceed to the second ballot. It will take two-thirds of votes for one candidate for an election on this ballot. Your voting is limited only to those who have already been on the ballot. We cannot add any more names. You need to click on the name you wish to vote for using the voting tool at the bottom of your convention platform. You are able to change your vote or your selection until voting is closed, but the last name you click is the one that will be recorded, so be careful with that. As I mentioned, we're going to allow two minutes for voting, so um, keep that in mind. And now before we vote, um, let us pray. God, you call us in many ways to follow you and serve you in our lives, in our church, in our communities. We pray for these candidates who have been nominated to serve in this position as vice chair. We pray for the voting delegates now that their hearts and minds would be open to discern how the Holy Spirit is calling them to vote. Bless our decision making and bless whoever will become our next vice chair. We give you thanks for all of these candidates and for the gifts that they offer. In Jesus' name, amen. So you have two minutes, and I invite you to put the voting uh, ballot up. And you'll, there are a lot of names, so you will have to scroll down. And you have two minutes. Please vote. Six seconds left. And that is your two minutes. Thank you. I'm going to ask for balloting to be closed, for voting to be closed. And we'll send on the results to the Elections Committee. Thank you. I hope that was more timely for you. One of the things that's new about this convention is it is the first time that the office or that the members of NCC have been given a vote at convention and that includes the officers. So I find myself having to remind myself continually that I get to vote too and then having to step down from the podium to, to take action on that. So if you see me jumping up and down, that's why I actually have the vote. It's now my pleasure to call on Kyle Giesbrook, Director of Finance and Administration, to give the financial report. Welcome, Kyle. Thank you. My name is Kyle Giesbrook. 
and I'm the finance, uh, director of finance administration with the national office, and I'm also the convention manager. I have the opportunity to address convention today to talk about our financial uh, state of the national office. Um, a good part of our discussions are about material that you'll find on pages E89 to E101 of your uh, bulletin of reports and the appendix 13 in the appendices folder in box. Uh, so my key areas of presentation today are going to be trying to address uh, some key questions. One, uh, are the, uh, is the application of our dollars being applied to, uh, uh, in a historical and financial statements? Are these funds used equally and are they balanced? Uh, are our funds sustainable and what does the future hold? And in what way are we reliant on our sources of income? Uh, first, we'll look at the historical uh, context of our financials, which is our audited financial statements. Uh, on page one and two of our audited financial statements, uh, you'll see that uh, we have an audit opinion. And on our audit opinion, we have a unqualified audit opinion, which is an important aspect to our audit. Uh, on page three, I'll draw you to our uh, net assets, um, which are, uh, sorry, our assets which have increased to $26 million. Uh, on page four, uh, I'll draw you to our uh, net income, which is just over $1.4 million, with our investment income of $1.5 million. And our total investments have reached a balance of $23,213,000. $826. Uh, another key aspect of our f uh, audit that I would like to draw your attention to is on page 11. There you'll see that our CNC in investments uh, created a, a, an amount of $720, uh, sorry, $720,745 that was paid out to synods. On page 14, uh, I'll draw your attention to note 12. There we uh, have an important amount of $840,000 that was received late last year in the form of a bequest. Um, and, uh, one other big aspect to our operations is the lack of expenses due to COVID that we've experienced over the last couple of years. This has had a pretty substantial in, uh, impact on our travel and meeting costs. The next question is, are we balanced uh, in terms of our income and expenses? In the last five years, except for 2018, our income has been uh, exceeding our budgeted amount. The average health over our last five years, as you can see in this uh, um, graphic, has definitely been uh, above where we have been budgeting. Our best guess and planning over the next uh, couple years uh, is um, uh, very hard to gauge right now. Uh, we are still kind of figuring our, our operations in our new environment um, and trying to get back into a little bit more of a normal travel and meeting uh, type of operation. Uh, one thing to note is that our benevolence trends are continuing to decline and have been declining for some years, and our reliance on investment income for our operations is growing to meet that change. Kyle, I just want to ask, do you want questions now, or do you want questions at the end of your presentation? Uh, I, I, can, I can take a question now, that's fine. I see Shay has your hand up. So Shay, is there a question to give to Kyle? I, w I was just wondering if he could read out the, the slide information. I can't read on my screen because my screen is smaller. I can't read that slide with the date, with the numbers of, of that information. Would it be possible for him to just read that out? Uh, uh, can, can we make that a wide screen? Oh, much better. Thank you. Does that help, Shay? Yes, very much. Thank you. 
Does that help you, Shay, to see the numbers, or do you still want them read out? Yeah, we're good. Okay. No, that's that, good. That's, I can now read them. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. The numbers are, I'm, we're trying to present information in a useful way, and sometimes when they're big numbers and a lot of years, um, it's hard to display them uh, in a way that's uh, visually uh, acceptable. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, so like I said, um, our, our benevolence trends are on the, uh, overall on the way down, and um, we've become more reliant on our uh, endowments and our investments to uh, make up for uh, those shortfalls. Um, with regards to the, the CECF, CECF uh, fund, um, there's been a lot of transition over the last, uh, since our last convention. Uh, one of them is that uh, we no longer have any mortgages held by the CECF, and also uh, we are transitioning into a more synodical mission-based operating fund out of the CECF, uh, which is a big change, and we were re reflecting that by updating the CECF handbook. The, uh, the life fund is, uh, so our, our operations have three funds overall. Uh, yeah, uh, I think so. Uh, we're on slide 12, sorry. There we go, uh, one back, I think one back. There we go. Uh, yeah, so the life uh, fund, as you can see here, um, so some of the major changes to the life fund is that we no longer have any mortgages through the life fund as well. Um, our life certificate program has ended, and the Women of Faith Fund program has also wound up. Uh, and there are only a small number of active annuities that our office still is uh, on contract with. The major fund, uh, the major function of the life fund is uh, of administering the endowments and trusts that we have in the national office. And most of these endow uh, endowments are to help with special projects, uh, ad hoc programs, and to help with any budgetary shortfalls. So if we can go to the uh, reliance question. Uh, so, as you can see from, uh, perfect, thank you for making that a full screen. Um, as you can see from this pie chart, uh, the majority of our sources of income, uh, the, the uh, top right corner you can't see very well, it's hi highlighted in green, uh, that says benevolence, um, and on the left side is investments, so those two pieces of the pie make up uh, well over half of our reliance on investments uh, in any given year. Um, our, our pie is uh, shifting slightly from the benevolent side to the investment side as, uh, as the realities of uh, our smaller benevolence kind of uh, take hold. Um, we've also been very uh, lucky uh, over the last couple years with our returns on our investment. Um, that being said, 2022 has uh, not been very great for our investments, but that is kind of standard for the overall marketplace. Uh, and uh, we'll see what the rest of the year uh, has to hold for us, but hopefully uh, things will be um, productive for us. And also, um, yeah, I think it's just uh, uh, one of the things that we try to plan for. and and take into account with uh, a lot of our uh, investment policies about trying to be uh, conservative and plan for rainy days. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to uh, thank a couple people, uh, well, groups of people. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the Finance Committee, who uh, provide uh, me uh, quite a bit of help and direction throughout the, the year. I'd also to help uh, facilitate the, uh, the successful completion of our audit. 
And I'd like to thank our um, in-house staff who helped with uh, maintaining our books and keeping everything uh, on the reporting side uh, nice and clean and, and uh, safe. Thank you very much, Kyle. And I believe you now have some time for questions. Doug, I don't. Thank you. We lost the sound when you were talking. I didn't hear my voice being uh, <laughs> asked. Uh, just had a question. What is deferred revenue? Please, could you give me an example? Uh, so uh, we get a restricted income sometimes. Um, so uh, income that is uh, directed towards a f certain purpose. And sometimes we can't expend all of the funds on that purpose. So we defer it until we can. So it's a way that we carry over funds from one way, one year to the other, but still maintaining how they're directed. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, on, our, on our statement of uh, financial position, it is uh, shown as a liability because we have an obligation to meet yet on that money. Uh, when we meet that obligation, it will be for us to spend funds that are directly related to how that money is uh, directed to be spent. Thank you. Thank you, and I see Shay. On the last slide, the income sources slide, what is the fee for services? Um, that was the third, I think it was the third largest um, part, part of the graph. So um, just wonder is what is that fee for services? Oh, and I forgot, I'm Shay uh, from Alberta Northwest Territory Synod, lay delegate. Thanks Shay. Uh, so, uh, Fees for service are uh, such things as uh, Canada Lutheran, um, things that people pay for their uh, involvement in. Um, uh, uh, I, I can't, uh, if, if the pie chart could get put back up, uh, uh, sorry. But yeah, uh, it, it's more things people pay for involvement in, and the best example that we have on a uh, going forward basis is Canada Lutheran. People pay for that service. Does that also include the monies that come in for things like convention and the youth gathering and the national worship conference? Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, in that chart, I did include things like clay uh, and national worship conference as, as part of that pie. So um, some years that pie is quite big because clay can be pretty substantial in some of its sources of revenue, depending on um, the, the uh, registration numbers, but uh, that's where that's from. Jordan. Smith. Hello, uh, Jordan Smith, delegate for the Eastern Synod roster delegate. Um, thanks, Kyle, for all the information and the report. So I had a question about the uh, very generous bequest. From what I can see, it looks like it was designated to the Life Fund, which, if I'm reading the documents correct, looks like it doubled the balance of that fund. So I guess just one question. Uh, first was whether that designation was a decision by the donor or was that a policy decision from the ELCIC? Um, and maybe can either you or the bishop speak a bit more to what this fund has been used for in the past and what its future might hold up with this increased balance. All right. Uh, so um, that fund, that money was given uh, with a directive, and that directive uh, was met. So we were putting it into the life fund to help us. Uh, basically give us a little bit of time to determine how we want to use that money. We want to be uh, diligent and um, purposeful with, with how we decide to use that money because it is a pretty substantial gift and we want to make sure we're, we're potentially looking at um, ways we can put it into partial endowments um, and to use it for other uh, ongoing work in the national office. I believe the designation was for mission, and as you know, mission can be interpreted in many ways, and we don't want to dishonor the donor uh, by moving too cautiously to assume what was meant. So um, we will determine how, um, how, what the designation is actually for and how best to steward it. The other thing that you know is that undesignated bequests do have a formula that we have uh, for you, so it isn't at the whim of the National Church. It's a formula we have adopted 
10% of which is to go to the endowment fund of the Lutheran World Federation, and the rest is, to, is split between our special projects fund, fund that allows us to do new work and between the endowment fund um, to help growing uh, the income that we need to support the church. Thank you for that clarification. It's amazing, I've learned a couple of things over the years. <laughs> I see Doug. Doug, can you please introduce yourself and where you're from? Oh, we lost Doug. How about Alana? Oh, there he's Doug, sorry. Doug, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, I'm, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? I, okay, I think I'm being heard. Doug from Nanaimo. Uh, just wondering, uh, how do I find out where, um, what our investments are? what investments that uh, we are uh, gaining revenue from. Uh, that is not information that we uh, publicly disclose exactly where all of our investments are, um, at least not on a, on a regular basis. Uh, most of our investments are uh, in a couple different um, uh, funds. Um, one of the, the majority of our money is uh, managed by the TD Wealth Management. Uh, we also do have some investments with Elfec and um, with a local credit union in Winnipeg called Steinbach Credit Union. But we Thank have you. a policy about yes. socially responsible investment. If that's yes. what the question was. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we do have an investment policy that prohibits the investment into various uh, types of companies. Uh, we also do have to invest in blue chip uh, grade E uh, stock, and we are also limited to how much of our overall investments can be into uh, stocks. Uh, most of our uh, uh, investments need to be in fixed income, which are like bonds. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to recognize Alana. Alana, can you introduce yourself and say what synod you're from? Hi, I'm Alana Patswald. I am from the Saskatchewan Synod as a lay delegate. It's my first time at convention. Um, Kyle, I'm not sure if this question can be um, addressed right now, but I noticed the funds that are used for Canada Lutheran, and a lot of that was um, in printing and posting, postage for the magazine. Is there any talk of putting that resource online, um, maybe making it available to more people or having a dual platform, both printed and online? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Lana. That's a great question, and it's a good opportunity for us to talk about our uh, Canada Lutheran uh, virtual subscription that's available, and it's been available for, uh, I want to say, a year and a half. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, the, we do have an online subscription option for sure. Um, it is not; it hasn't been around for that long, but it's re and it's relatively new. But it's a great question, and it's something that our office uh, definitely is hoping to. Uh, become more of our uh, business source for Canada Lutheran because, like you said, the paper and the postage is, is a, a big, uh, big part of that uh, cost. Thank you, Alana. Roy Tuckerdahl, please introduce yourself and say where you're from. My name is Roy Tuckerdahl. I'm from the Eastern Synod, uh, Worcester Delegate. Uh, my question has to do with the benevolent uh, part of the pie, we see the trend continuing of uh, diminishing returns uh, from the benevolence. Uh, my question is, um, if this trend continues, and I don't see it not continuing um, into the future, um, what do you see uh, some of the more significant implications for the national church, its missions and functions? Thank you. Do you want me to take it? Yeah, I think that's a good one. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. Always a good question. Um, as you see, yes, benevolence is decreasing, and that's a trend. Um, there's a couple factors in that. Uh, firstly, all synods do not give the same percentage of their synod benevolence to the national church. And the other thing is that even if synods hold their line on benevolence, if they're receiving less money, then of course, they're giving proportionately the same amount, but the dollar value is less. 
it does have implications for us going forward, and I think that is something that we as a whole church will have to look at. Uh, the national church can certainly struggle with that on its own and decide um, what program areas are more important and where we need to make cuts, but that would make difficult decisions mostly around staffing um, because that is the largest part of our budget. We can also talk about a whole church um, decision. That's something that we tried to do a number of years ago through the Structural Renewal Task Force. But it seems to me if the national church will be struggling in terms of how to meet its financial responsibilities, and the synods will be too. So eventually we're going to have some um, conversations about how are we called to be church and what is the best way we can express ourselves going forward and where are the areas we really do need to give support. Um, it's both scary and it's exciting, but as I mentioned in my report, as long as we're growing in the important ways of faithfulness and deepening in our discipleship, I think we will have the courage to be able to face those challenges head on. In the meantime, we all ask for your prayers. I see Christina Kunert. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Christina Kunert. I am a lay delegate of the Eastern Synod. Um, I'm looking through my E98, E99, E100, and I'm noticing that in 2021, the special projects lines were empty, and that's also the same in both 2022 charts. Uh, in addition to there are like lots of blinks in the 2022 budget in the bulletin of reports. And I'm wondering if somebody can help me understand what I'm looking at here. Uh, yes, I definitely can. Um, so uh, there's three different budget reports. Um, some of them are based on programs and how they impact the bottom line. So they're net. So if it's a neutral program, it'll be zero. That means the cost and the revenues are the same. Uh, there's also a report that shows almost the exact same information, just broken out between revenue and expenses. So some, uh, some programs, and you can see there's quite a few of them, uh, some of them are more uh, neutral to the bottom line, they're cost neutral, um, but some of them are more cost centers and some of them are more revenue lines. Uh, for, ex for example, uh, benevolence doesn't have any costs there, but salaries doesn't have any revenue. Uh, so, so you can kind of see how some of our sources of income overall spread over to the entire uh, uh, operation of our office. I hope that helps. Hey, you're welcome. It looks like you have another satisfied customer, Carl. <laughs> Kyle, I did it again. <laughs> Are there any further questions for Kyle? Seeing none, I think we will thank you very much. And I know that at the last moment, you're subbing in for our treasurer, Jean Blishen. And so again, I want to remind the whole convention to pray for Jean and his family as they face challenges at this time. So we have a couple of motions that we need to deal with. Kyle, I'll ask you to stay up oh, sure. in case there are further questions related to them. The first one has to do with the revised budget for um, 2022. And so the motion that would come before you, this is coming from NCC, would be that the National Convention approve the revised budget for 2022. May I have someone move that motion using the raise hand feature? I see Audrey and Rebecca moving and seconding. Oh, and a whole bunch of other people. Deb and Mark, oh, okay, we've got lots. Thank you very much. It is moved and seconded and thirded and fourthed. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? I'll ask you one more time. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to the vote. And I'll ask you to bring up the voting screen for this motion. Motion that the National Convention approve the revised budget for 2022. Please vote now 
and we'll give you two minutes. Thank you very much. I'll ask for the balloting to be closed. And when you're ready, I'd be happy to see the results of that vote. 100%, we have passed the revised budget. Thank you very much. There's one more um, budget or finance related motion we need to do. And that is that the National Convention receive the 2021 audited statements. May I have someone move that? Again, Mark, thank you, and Shay, and Trudy, and Bruce. That's lots of movers and seconders. Thank you. Do I feel like the woman from Romper Room, or was it the Sunshine School? I don't know what, but I, I love this recognizing individuals. Thank you very much. Is there any discussion on the motion? Any questions about the motion to approve the audited statements? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to call for the voting screen. And I will ask you to vote. You have your two minutes. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, we'll ask, I'll call that balloting is closed and I will ask for the results. Oh, very quickly, 100% again. Thank you, that's great. We're just going to take a little bit of a pause here. Not very long one, but a little bit of a pause as we wait for the results from the elections committee. Um, it's very close, so I don't want to move on to something else. And I know you will all be interested in hearing the results of the second ballot. So talk amongst yourself. <laughs> or uh, if anyone has a burning question for me, this is the time. If you want to give me the weather report from where you are. Oh, Shay, hi, how are you? Good, I just have a suggestion uh, for the online format. When we're yeah. reviewing a document or something, could you give the section and the page number? Um, if possible, put it in the chat. So, you know, if, if we have an internet hiccup that we can get it, because it just makes it quite a bit quicker to find the doc. Um, I've read most of them, but I don't remember in what one the budget is and in what one this is and that type of thing. So just as we go along, if you could do that, that would be very helpful for finding them again quickly. Thank you, Shay. That's really helpful, and we will do our best to do that going forward. Sometimes I give the range of page numbers at the beginning, but that doesn't help you find the specific page. So we'll do our best to improve on that. Thank you. Kimber, hello. Hi, I'm uh, Kimber McNabb from Halifax in the Eastern Synod. And I've noticed something really uh, helpful. My internet is sometimes spotty and it's great because you can put the closed caption feature on. So when the, the, um, the you get garbled or freeze, the text still comes up on the bottom of the screen. And it's great for people who don't hear so well very much for that helpful suggestion, Kimber. Much appreciated. Anyone else with suggestions for how we can be doing better or helpful tips? Doug. Hi. Uh, Kim, just wondering, where do I go for the clothes you captured? To yourself, Doug, or there you are. Uh, Kim, just wondering where that closed caption screen is on Zoom. I seem to be. Um. So if you click <laughs> on more. Unmuted if he's not able to do it himself. I'm there. I'm unmuted. Problem when you just put your first name down. I'm looking for Doug. Schmerler, I thought yes. it was. Thank you, Bishop Susan. Uh, Doug Schmerler, Roster oh. Delegate for Saskatchewan Synod. I think it's awesome that we see that screen with the voting results come up on our main, on our main screen. Can the election screen not be done the same way? You mean the, the actual voting screen? Yes. It's an actual app that is done via a different application, so we cannot put that onto Zoom. It has to be done in a different way. Fair enough. Sorry about I, that. Nope, I know you need to master that, you. how to minimize one screen or both screens and toggle back and forth, and I know that has been a challenge for many of you, and I apologize for that. Um, that's why I'm really looking forward to next year when we're going to be live in person and hopefully go back to the way all of us know how to do things. But okay. I got to tell you, the, the, the technical people are wonderful and they're doing their very best. So yeah, yeah we'll give them a round of applause. Yes. I see Valerie. Hi, Valerie. Hi. Valerie. Valerie Hodson. I'm a, a lay delegate from the Eastern Synod. 
And I just wanted to add to Kimber's uh, information about this. If depending on your device, on my um, MacBook Air, there's a if you like run the cursor over the bottom, a window pops up that shows all the like live chat. And there's one that says live script. That's the one to click on to get that that writing that she had mentioned. Just another option. Excellent. We've got lots of technical help here. That's great. And I see Emily. I'm Emily Walker. I'm a youth delegate from the Eastern Senate, and I'm going to answer your call about the weather here. I'm in Toronto right now, land of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Anishinaabe Nation, and it is a balmy 27 degrees today. So on my lunch break there, I took a nice hot walk. So what's the weather like in Winnipeg today, Mr. Susan? Sunny and warm day here. So it has been lovely. It makes it a little toasty in the room here, but uh, we're doing fine. Thanks for asking. How are we doing from the Elections Committee? Are we close? Okay, the results are done. They just aren't on a screen yet, so we'll just give them another moment. Rain on the wet coast. Oh, I see Judy. Well, I see the top of Judy's face. I see your eyes, Judy. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. Updating weather from Nova Scotia. Hot, humid, and icky. Much, Judy. I like this. I feel like I'm on cross-country checkup. And now we have Karen. Karen, how are you doing? Uh, good, Bishop Susan. Uh, Karen Stepko, uh, roster delegate from SAS Senate. And uh, with the help of Facebook memories, I realized that 11 years ago today, I was in Salvo Beach, Ontario, watching the Saskatoon 2011 convention, which I think was the first one to be live streamed on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. So yeah, uh, I'm back. I'm still watching online, <laughs> but I have a, a vote and I'm a roster delegate now, so. <laughs> Excellent. Congratulations on your journey. We're glad you're still with us. And is that Sheila, a, Sheila Attendee? I don't think Attendee is your last name, Sheila, but introduce yourself. Oh, and you need to unmute yourself, Sheila. Uh, Sheila Taylor from Alberta and Northwest Territory Synod Lay Delegate. Uh, 31 degrees in South Central Alberta. So it's warm. So, and I actually see a couple people I recognize. So this is really quite lovely. <laughs> Russ Stakem. Russ, you need to unmute yourself. There we go. Uh, Russ Stakem, lay delegate from MNO Synod. Um, I would like to recommend that this voting system we're using on for the online also be used for future in person um, with uh, everybody basically has a cell phone for the most part. And it's certainly efficient and handy and saves on the time spent by elections committee counting things up. Uh, I've been very pleased with it. Thank you very much, Russ. We appreciate the commendation. Matthew Deagle. Yeah, Matthew Deagle, uh, rostered minister delegate from MNO Senate, but I'm actually at uh, Vancouver School of Theology today, uh, and it's 19 degrees and raining, and I'm learning something about the UBC campus is that there's always construction going on, so I have to keep my mic muted except for this. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matthew. I was hoping we we're going to get a BC report in there. And now I see Lauren. And Lauren, you need to unmute yourself. There it is. Hi. Um, Lauren Corbett, a lay delegate um, from the BC Synod. And I'm just checking in to let you know that it is sunny and 29 over here. Not that I've gone outside yet today. Oh, we've lost Lauren. 
We've lost Lauren's sound. 29, that's amazing. Obviously, there's a big difference in different parts of BC. Thank you, Lauren. All right, and we have the results of the second ballot for vice chair. But thank you all for helping me help us pass the time. And it was delightful to see some familiar faces and hear some familiar voices. Lynn. So I noticed we're not quite in alphabetical order, but these are the results nevertheless. Thank you. So on the second ballot for vice chair, 170, 117 votes cast, and that means 78 are needed to elect. Bruce Cook, 31. John Nilsson, 12. Pat Lovell, 11. Angela Chorney, 10. Sheila Hamilton, 10. Greg Lingelbach, 8. Catherine Sue Blazer, five. Cheryl Bauer Hyde, four. Bill Gastmeyer, four. Stephen Holmes, three. Joe Stoley, three. Kathleen Jensen, two. Lori Kitchen, two. Don Storch, two. Lynn Slack, one. Rowan Diamond, one. Linda Erlinson, one. Linda Granger, one. Heather Howdell, one. Tim Lach, one. Tracy Middleholtz, one. Deb Roberts, one. Lori Scriver, one. Heidi Van Shake, one. Okay, that written report is really hard to see. Can we have it available in another format as soon as you can, please? In the meantime, let me remind you about what the process is. Um, we will, there is no election. Oh, that's much better, thank you. Can, let's, let's just see those slowly again. I won't make Lynn read them again, but just so you can scroll through them again. The document's now in box? Okay, that's great. Okay, let's see the next page. Oh, this is in numbers now, okay. Yeah. And the next page. Okay, and the next page. Oh, that is the last page, okay. Can we go back to the first page, please? So, um, there's no election. We move on to a third ballot, but there, there are a couple of things you know. The first thing you need to know is that um, bio, biographies have to be submitted by the candidates before the next ballot. And so, the deadline is 5 o'clock today. There is a bio form on the convention main page. You need to seek the permission of the person who's been nominated and ask them to fill in a bio form if you nominated them. If people do not submit a bio form, it's a pretty clear indication that they do not wish to serve. But that's the process. The second part of the process is for the third vote, we drop down to the top five candidates. Because we have a fourth place tie between two candidates, I would then say that on the next ballot, there would be Bruce Cook, John Nielsen, Pat Lovell, Angela Chorney, Sheila Hamilton. Our process does not allow for people to withdraw. I know there are a couple of people who are really wanting to, but um, you can signal that by not putting in a biography or people will have to hit you over the head and convince you this is the Holy Spirit working one or the other. Gentle on the hitting, please. Um, so again, we have five names moving forward to the third ballot. We thank everyone else who has made nominations and those candidates who have been nominated for their participation in the process. The five candidates remaining are asked to submit bios by five o'clock today. 
the bios, as soon as we receive them, will be put into um, the document section where you can find new documents and we will proceed to the next vote tomorrow. So sometime tonight, you're gonna to have to look at the bios and start preparing yourself for the next vote because we cannot take the time for you to think that through in the morning, okay? Homework. Judy, you have a question. Yes, Judy from the Nova Scotia. Um, if one of those persons do not submit a bio, does it take the next person on the list? No? The rules are the top five names go forward. The, the names of all the people will still appear on, of those five people will appear on the next ballot. We don't take them off. It's just they are trying to tell you, look, I don't want to do this, so you can make a decision. That's why we don't add more people. Okay? okay. Diana, you have a question? Diana Edis, rostered leader from British Columbia Senate, uh, Prince Rupert. Um, you said that the bios are due by five o'clock. Five o'clock, what time zone? Centrist. Five o'clock Winnipeg time. So that's three o'clock in BC, four o'clock in Alberta, four o'clock right now in Saskatchewan, three o'clock here in Winnipeg, two o'clock in Eastern or in Ontario and Quebec, and one o'clock in. I'm going the wrong way? Oh, sugar. All right, let me try that again. Five o'clock, three o'clock in Vancouver. I know that, that's where my mummy is. Three o'clock in Vancouver. I did that right, didn't I? No. Then I went the wrong way. Oh, I'm making him go both ways. Oh, how clever of me. All right, so I'm right until Winnipeg. Ontario is six, Atlantic is seven. Is that right? Newfoundland is 7.30. But, okay, I won't even go there. Thank you. Russ, you have a question? Russ Skakum. Uh, Russ Skakum, uh, lay delegate, MNO Senate. Maybe to make it a little clearer, um, 57 minutes from now is when the bios would be due. Thank you. That's very clear. Okay. We're going to move on in our agenda. Thank you. And um, I'm now pleased to call on the leadership from ELCIC Group Services, Inc., the chair of the board, John Wolf, and the executive director, Lisa Thiessen. Group Services does an excellent job in overseeing the pension and benefits for the employees of our church. So I want to welcome John and Lisa and let you know that their report is coming to us in the form of a video presentation. So let's sit back and learn something. Good afternoon, everyone, and greetings from GSI. Uh, I'm John Wolf, the president and board chair, and with me today is Lisa Thiessen, our executive director. And uh, we're so pleased to be able to provide you some highlights and updates since we last talked to you at the 2019 convention. Um, all of our um, topics that we're covering today, uh, you will also find in the corporate reports under section G, pages G4 and G5. And hopefully at the next convention, we can all get together in person again. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Lisa to get us started. Thanks, John. Our mission, GSI administers group benefits and a pension plan on behalf of ELCIC congregations and affiliates in the best interest of plan members. This mission has not changed since GSI began in 1997. We are looking forward to GSI's 25th anniversary this coming October and continuing to serve you into the future. The first topic in our report is wellness, which is the lens through which we carry out GSI's mission. And while the mission has been steadfast, we have continually expanded our perspective on what that means for congregations and members and how our services add value to the ELCIC. 
And so to augment our mission statement and to bring in that wellness perspective, we have added this value statement. GSI supports plan members in leading healthy lives and achieving financial security. A very recent example of GSI's continued review and quest for enhanced member value is a move to change the provider of the confidential support and counseling services. One of the important differentiators with this new partner called Humanicare is that when our members reach out for assistance, a registered nurse is typically the first point of contact on the intake call. We believe it is important to have knowledgeable and a listening person be there immediately when reaching out for assistance. These types of assistance plans with counseling services are a traditional part of a company wellness plan, and it's been part of this group plan for a long time. More recently, we have enhanced the wellness program by adding a lifestyle spending account. This account supports and encourages self-care. Members are allocated funds that can be used for fitness and recreation, education, counseling, or health expenses that are not covered under the traditional health plan. The last part of the value statement indicates that GSI supports members in achieving financial security. The ELCIC pension plan is the signature piece of that objective, and John will speak to that shortly. I would like to briefly highlight that GSI recognizes that each member has unique financial aspirations, and GSI has sponsored additional opportunities to achieve those. There are ELCIC group RRSP and TFSA accounts with investment options for plan members. We encourage members to reach out by calling GSI or checking our website for more information on these. So at this point, I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk a bit about governance for GSI and the GSI board. Uh, for those who are not aware, we are incorporated under the Manitoba Corporations Act, and we follow the corporate law uh, related to that. And we also have a very robust internal governance manual. Uh, GSI is governed by a board of directors. Uh, the board has eight members to it. Uh, we continually, as we seek new members and replace members, we seek to have a well-diversified set of skills, knowledge, and background that helps us uh, inform our decision-making. And these directors uh, work very, very hard on behalf of all the plan members, putting in many hardworking hours. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank them for all those volunteer efforts. Uh, that they that they engage in. So with that, um, I would like to just walk through some uh, key points on the governance process as it relates to the board. Firstly, when we look at any sort of issue or option or topic, um, we explore all of the options that may be relevant to that particular issue or topic. And where appropriate, we will engage professional consultants to insist us in this process. Those consultants can provide in-depth analysis and review and help us evaluate the various options uh, so that we can carry out our due diligence and be guided with that in our decision-making. Furthermore, we continually look at improvements that reflect changes in what's happening in our membership and also in the pension and benefits landscape uh, more broadly. And with all of that, uh, we keep an eye on being responsible to ensure that we have viable, affordable, and sustainable plans, taking into account what the issues are that are facing our plan members, as well as the concerns of our struggling congregations. So, I just want to provide some context that we use when we're making our doing our reviews and making our decisions. Uh, the chart here shows our plan membership and employers oh, since the beginning of the pension and benefit plans in 1986. And you can see those trend lines. The blue line at the top are plan members and the red line are employers. 
At the peak, we had 937 plan members. Today, at the end of 2021, we're down to 452. And you may note that in the mid 90s, there was a, a significant increase in plan members, and then again, a drop off in the early 2000s. And that just reflects when Augustana came on board and then subsequently left again and joined University of Alberta. But what's interesting is that the chart, if you look at roughly the last 10 years, the chart shows a very similar underlying trend line for both plan members and employers. And that provides some critical context and information to the board as we look at the, uh, the issues going forward and what direction and options we uh, need to explore. Furthermore, we have a very unique demographic um, that we are working with. And again, this is, it's important for us to keep, uh, keep this in mind and have this as a context. Uh, if you look at this pie chart, uh, over half of our plan membership is between age 55 and 71. Uh, we stopped the chart at age 71 because under federal legislation, you can't contribute and participate in a pension plan after age 71. So, you know, we have a very uh, aging demographic. Uh, it's also noteworthy to see that we have 30 plan members who are over the age of 71 and still enrolled in the benefits program. So this is a very unique uh, demographic, and it's something that we need to uh, continually be aware of as we look at, at the programs we engage in. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Lisa to talk a little more in depth about our various benefit programs. John, so moving on to the benefits plan. This section in our written report included in the Convention Bulletin of Reports points to two main events in the recent past the health redesign, and the life insurance market review. There was a significant governance process leading up to the change of the group health plan. Getting member feedback was our critical first step. A plan member survey indicated that 90% of the respondents highly valued the benefits plans. The importance of the benefits plan to the member has to then be balanced with the rising costs of health care and the ability for the employers to pay for it. These cost increases are due to a number of things, including medical innovations, drug improvements or discoveries, and also our aging population that John just talked about points to more disease prevalence. The other finding during this process was a directive for more flexibility. This was addressed by creating the various modules and by adding the spending accounts. This design has now been in place for about a year and a half, and while these are not usual times due to COVID, which makes it hard to do a true evaluation, the feedback so far confirms that this has been a positive move and it is going well. The Life Plus Benefit Bundle supports various life events, such as parental leave, life insurance, or a medical disability. A review of our experiences with the provider indicated that again, a change was warranted. And after a market search, a new, a new insurer was appointed earlier this year. And I'm just gonna turn it back to John one last time. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I would like to just talk a little bit about our annual report. And just as a highlight, we're very excited that we have a new modern design for that annual report. And we trust that you have found that uh, helpful and useful. And uh, we thank those of you who have given us some positive uh, feedback on, on that change. So I'm gonna uh, do a few highlights out of the annual report. Uh, the first one being uh, the invested assets of the pension plan. And you will see on the pie chart uh, that we have a very broad and diverse uh, investment portfolio for the plan. Um, at the end of 2021, uh, we had uh, approximately $100 million in assets in the plan. And the pie chart breaks down where these assets are invested. So the slices that are in green shade are fixed income, 
and the slices that are in the blue shade are, are growth uh, fund or equities. And all the plan member accounts are invested in a mix of fixed income and growth fund assets. Um, and over the past number of years, we have found that having this broad and diverse portfolio has served us well in terms of uh, providing returns out of the plan. And if we look at the last five years of investment returns, um, you can see the results um, year by year. One of the things that we were very pleased with was that during the three pandemic years, we were able to maintain very healthy investment returns, uh, despite all the challenges in the economy and across, across the globe. Uh, you'll also note that, you know, cycles, uh, markets do go in cycles and uh, they always will, but it's, it's worthy noting that they do recover and, you know, provide some healthy returns in that recovery. So with that, um, I'll move on to another topic, and that is pension alternatives. This is something that the board has discussed over the past number of years. And in late 2021 and early this year, we undertook some significant actions on looking at these alternatives. There was also a motion from Eastern Synod that uh, requested that we do a more in-depth review. Uh, so we have undertaken that. And to do that, uh, we engaged an actuary uh, so that we would get uh, the independent expertise of an actuary in terms of doing the analysis and the review and providing us with um, input as to what alternatives there are out there and what those alternatives look like. And I, I will just bring us back again to one of the points I made under the governance model, and that is we look at all options when we look at something like this. So it was very important that we look at several options and that we have professional assistance to do that. We did that uh, analysis. The actuary provided a report that was reviewed by the board and was also, we also shared the findings with National Church Council and you may have noted that in the May newsletter, uh, we discussed that report and provided links on our website. Uh, I do, do also want to just highlight a few key findings that came out of that report, because I think it's important to note those. One of the things that uh, was, was very uh, enlightening in terms of the results of the report was that once you equalized assumptions uh, between the various plan alternatives, uh, there was no significant difference in the pension income outcomes uh, that the actuary created. And, and I think it's important to again emphasize having an actuary that has the expertise that looks at the actual plan documents as well as the projection calculations and equalizes everything so that it's very comparable between uh, between plans. And as I say, no significant differences came to light. Uh, no single alternative provided better results uh, for all members. Uh, it was a mix. And in fact, the ELCIC current plan had the most uh, positive results for uh, positive results for the most plan members. So I think that's, you know, we, we, we spent a lot of time and uh, did a lot of really good deep analysis uh, from the actuary and uh, have that as an outcome. The other thing that the actuary noted was that if you're going to change from our existing plan to another alternative, there were some challenges and hurdles that needed to be dealt with. And depending on what alternative plan you were looking at, um, there were some reporting challenges. In some cases, there were differences into, in what was considered as the base for making contributions. 
And also they sometimes had uh, limitations on the amount of your current account uh, balances that you could transfer in. So those, those were other things that we considered. Um, the actuary also noted that in terms of our current plan, given that we have a unique membership, it is well designed to support that membership and provide pension income. Uh, they commented on how well the plan was managed and the fact that it did provide a good pension uh, for the plan members that we currently have. So those were the, the key findings in there. And I, you know, I think in summary, what it has told us is that given that there were no clear, strong alternatives that look better, it does not at this point in time make sense to consider an alternative given the costs the cost. and work involved. So with that, um, I just wanted to comment as well on what some of our future directions are <laughs> stop turning at the board. We're always looking at things like those trends we saw in terms of plan membership, demographics, what's happening out in the industry and uh, both uh, you know locally and across the country and the pension industry and the benefits industry. So one of the things that we've done over the years, and we're again this fall, we're setting aside one and a half days for the board to do in-depth strategic planning. And we're gonna dive very deeply into what, you know, where we are today, where things are going and what else we need to look at in, in terms of options. And once we have done that, that will help us then start working on the detailed implementation and operational plans that come out of the strategies that we identify in, in that session. So we will co communicate more of that next year uh, as we move forward. And speaking of communications, uh, you are probably aware that we have many avenues that we use for communications. I've already touched on the annual report that comes out to all plan members. We also have our monthly newsletters that go to plan members and twice a year, we send newsletters to the treasurers. Uh, note that all those newsletters are on our website so you can access them there, either current or past ones. Uh, also the website contains all the information related to the pension plan and the benefit plans. So if you have things that you're trying to understand or have questions about things, please go to the website. It contains an awful lot of information. If you don't feel that you can get the information you need on the website or don't, can't quite follow it, you can email uh, GSI at the email address that's listed below, or you can call us on our toll-free number. And as I fondly like to refer to that, it's called 1-800-CALL-BARB. Uh, and we're happy to support you and answer your questions. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for taking the time to let us share our information. And we look forward to seeing you again in person in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, John and Lisa. We thank you for your report. Obviously, we can't receive questions at this time, so please use the communication vent, uh, avenues that they just outlined to get in touch with John and Lisa if you have comments or questions. I now call on Reverend Dr. Karen Ochterstetter for the report of Canadian Lutheran World Relief. You can find her written report on page H1 in the Bulletin of Reports. As you know, CLWR is our partner in the important international work of compassionate justice. Karen, we look forward to your report. Greetings from Winnipeg, greetings from T Treaty One territory, and I'm really happy to be here at Faith Lutheran, I must say. We are just a few people, but it's still lovely to feel this com community. So it's great to be here. And I just want to add, it's, or it's just outside, it's 29 degrees Celsius outside. Here in the room, it's about 49 degrees, <laughs> but I'm just going to mention that. <laughs> 
And I'm so pleased um, to be here and to have this opportunity to speak on behalf of Canadian Lutheran World Belief today. And I'm also pleased to have with us, at least online, members of our staff, our board, and of course our president, Cheryl bauer Hyde. I would like to offer my deep appreciation to Bishop Susan, to the Synod Bishops, the National Church Council, the staff of ELCIC, and to all of you for this opportunity to share, even as you've had to truncate your convention. So thank you for giving us time. We are so grateful for the ELCIC and for the privilege of partnering in mission with you. Your faith has been a light for so many, including us at CLWR during these last years. And we at CLWR are proud to be your partners. As you make decisions during these days that will shape your ministry in years to come, we are praying that you would be filled with wisdom, faith, and courage in this process. We are also continuing to lift up the global body of Lutheran World Federation. It is the members of this body around the world who make CLWR's work possible and allow us to pursue justice with urgency, with efficiency, professionalism, and with compassion. My last opportunity to address this body was just three years ago. But sometimes 2019 might feel some for us like um, a lifetime ago, and for others it seemed just like it was yesterday. Since that time, we have all learned a new word. I think you can guess what this is, coronavirus. We've seen the world come together in some inspiring ways, and we have also experienced a world that is incredibly divided and fragmented, including within our own country. We've seen war return to Europe, which touches very close to home for many Lutherans in Canada, as we consider our own family stories and our history. And as COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine have occupied headlines, meanwhile, after years of progress, we've seen global hunger spike to record levels, with millions facing the very real threat of famine. Climate change has continued to influence weather patterns with extreme weather events. And I can tell you, that these have impacted very directly many of those we serve in places like Ethiopia and El Salvador. So in the context of these last years and where we find ourselves today, I'm really grateful for the theme of your convention, Let There Be Greening. As your global ministry partner, we have the responsibility to bear witness back to you about the global impacts of climate change and conflict. And there are many tragic stories we can share about the individual lives that have been appended. Of farmers forced to abandon their fields or the village whose water source has run dry. But we also have the privilege of reporting back on the, about the other stories we hear, stories of resilience and creativity, and of how this ministry you share in is giving people a chance they wouldn't otherwise have, the stories of greening. This young woman is Irvani. She's a participant in one of our projects in Burundi. Irvani's smile is the smile of a mother who no longer worries about feeding her twin boys. Today, Irvani grows all the food the family needs to eat. And her farm is growing. 
leaving her with more to sell after feeding her family. She says she doesn't worry about her children's health anymore. Let there be greening. It's not an exaggeration to tell you that Irvana's future was bleak. In Burundi, like in many countries right now, food insecurity is increasing. We are in the midst of a hunger crisis on a historical scale. It is not improving and there is urgent need for support. That will be quite literally life-saving. But when you look at Irvani and hear her story, I hope you do not see a passive recipient of charity, but someone who is fighting to build the future for herself and her family, despite the injustices they have faced. Irvani is not a beneficiary of someone's charity. Through your participation in this ministry, you join in in her movement. You extend solidarity. And I'm here today to offer thanks because of your steadfast support over these last years. Through all of the challenges of COVID-19, the support of the ELCIC for our work has only grown. It is an incredible testimony to your faith and your commitment to justice and compassion. When COVID-19 began its spread, we were planning for Cecile WR's 75th anniversary. And there was great uncertainty about what the pandemic would mean for our work. But you quickly showed us that whatever happened, you would not forget those we serve around the world. Faced with the world in crisis, you responded, just like Lutherans in Canada did more than 75 years ago. It's because of that generosity that I'm now able to offer a report of hope and of greening to tell you that your partnership has truly made a difference. Because of your kindness, there are so many good news stories happening in our world. Let me briefly share some of these stories. As travel restrictions have begun to ease, one of my very first trips was to see the good news stories you are making possible in the West Bank. There, you are part of a movement that is challenging the poverty and unemployment that Palestinian women face. Your support has allowed us to expand our technical and vocational training program, especially focusing on equitable access for women and girls, and for people living with disabilities. Since then, we have begun to receive such incredible stories of what women are accomplishing when just two years ago, they couldn't even access education or were extremely restricted in the types of work available for them. In El Salvador, your partnership in protecting vulnerable farmers from climate change with an innovative new form of crop insurance, challenging a root cause of, of migration by keeping farmers farming and allowing them to keep feeding their <coughs> communities. In Burundi, where Irani is building a new future, a new project is, brief, is bridging the gap between short-term emergency relief and long-term development by giving families like hers the tools to recover from crisis and to rebuild their own livelihoods. And in Venezuela, your support is challenging <coughs> the injustices of the pandemic, stocking the cupboards of a medical clinic <coughs> in a district of Caracas, badly hit by COVID-19. And when war broke out in Ukraine, your support helped our partners to be among the first on the ground, delivering aid and welcoming those fleeing the war. As we continue to pray for peace, 
we want you to know that your generous response to the emergency appeal issued by CLWR and ELCIC is providing real comfort and hope to the families who are being affected. And regardless of whether the new spotlights moves on to another story, your support means that our partners will still be there when the news has traveled and this will be, will, take, will be there for a long time to come, providing critical support to those who need it most. I'm especially grateful for the way that your congregations have adapted to ensure the continuation of refugee resettlement here in Canada throughout the pandemic. Despite travel restriction, quarantine requirements and more, Churches have remained dedicated to this mission of rescue and arrivals to Canada have continued. In fact, we have increased staffing at our refugee resettlement offices because your congregations remain so committed to this work. Across the country, there are stories of dozens of families who now have the opportunity to build a new life in safety in Canada because of ELCIC congregations dedicated to making these stories of hope possible. And we have heard from so many congregations who are only waiting for their chance to be next. This is only a glimpse of the stories of hope and greening that your partnership has made in these last years. We take such inspiration from the steadfastness of your compassion and your faith. And it is our prayer that this report might offer encouragement in return. There is much that's uncertain about the years ahead, but the last couple of years have convinced me that whatever is to come, there will be stories of greening. And this moment and this movement of the people of God will be there. Thank you for the opportunity you give us to do this work on behalf of you. And thank you for your partnership in our ministry. Let there be greening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karin. We have time for a couple of questions, if there are any questions. Vida, please unmute yourself. Please. Yes, um, my question is uh, pertains to the uh, relief uh, efforts in Ukraine and wondering if there the CLWR um, has links with Lutheran churches in Ukraine. Um, it'd be wonderful to be able to share stories uh, with the congregation about, you know, Lutheran, uh, specifically Lutheran sort of activity and the, the impact on Lutheran churches or congregations in Ukraine, um, other than just, you know, the news doesn't give us uh, those kinds of stories from on the ground, from people living there and people um, of faith being impacted. Yeah, I can um, speak directly to that. First of all, um, I had the privilege to attend um, the LWF Council and during the Council, the um, Lutheran Church of the Ukraine actually became a member of the Lutheran World Federation, so I think that's important to note. But at the same time, I think the beauty of the work the LWF is doing is that it is always also working with the congregations and the churches locally. And I think that's imp why we don't have this story nece necessarily, however, is because we serve everybody in need. So some of the stories that we receive are the stories of 
all the people that are getting our support and that come to one of the centers um, for either internally displaced people or they arrive at the border. So there we don't count in any way and even don't even ask the question, um, what is your faith background or what is your belief? But at the same time, I can reassure you that through the Lutheran World Federation, we are working closely with the congregations that are in Ukraine, but also with Lutheran congregations at, in the other countries that are the border countries to, to Ukraine. Thank you very much. And uh, Vida, you can also find more information on the Lutheran World Federation website. There have been some postings that mm -hmm. talk specifically about the impacts on the Lutheran Church in Ukraine. David Tin. Hi, Bishop. Uh, David Tin uh, from Rockham Eastern Synod, uh, roster delegate. Uh, I am working with the National Church with uh, Bishop Susan in the Welcome Angels, which is a national initiative of welcoming uh, new arrivals uh, in Canada. Uh, one of the chapters is for the Ukrainians. And right now in my local community, we're working with uh, 22 new arrival Ukrainians and also with our Anglican partners in nearby Stouffville and other 20 families. So we're working around 40 plus Ukrainian new arrival families in the last two and a half months. Uh, I think the question is, as I see the, your report, uh, Karen, is that uh, because Ukrainians are not classified as refugee status in Canada, they're under Kuwait, so the, they are a totally new category of support from the government, and a lot of the things has not been properly set up yet. So they're all looking for all kind of support, which not yet ready set up for them. And I see the report uh, that is uh, a concern and care about the Ukrainians in uh, arriving. Would the CLWL find a way to uh, um, to include in the mandate to work with the Ukrainians? But they are not classified as refugee programs. So I'm just uh, want to know that as we continue to to support them, because like my congregation, we are taking in hosting three families right now. Thank you very much. I think it was more a comment than a question. I think the question is, is CLWR because it works with refugees Please. working to bring in people from Ukraine because they aren't classified as refugees. Okay, so um, thanks for the clarification. Um, we received a number of phone calls, of course, and um, in both refugee resettlement offices asking questions about um, the situation and also the status of Ukrainians. So um, one of the, I think, the important issues we have to address is that we have at the moment 100 million people who are forced to flee into the category of who is a refugee fit 26 million at the moment. So what you see is that the, that the definition of who is a refugee is very, very narrow. Even, just like 25% of those people that are forced to flee because of conflict, because of um, what we just heard, climate change, because of other um, situations, only approximately a quarter of those at the moment fit into the refugee status. So as a, an agreement holder with the Canadian government, the CLWR is actually only able to focus on those that have the official designation of being refugees. So what we are now debating with congregations, because we are aware of the need, is that we are trying to give them as much information as possible, how to help Ukrainians that are arriving, but at the same time, we wait also for um, clearer information from the government, how we as agreement holders can be part of those interventions. But we don't know yet how, we haven't got um, clear information about that. But I also want to use that occasion to remind you that there are many, many refugees 
waiting to be supported and to be sponsored. And I especially would like to mention um, the Operation Afghan Safety. We have 100 spaces allocated. We received those 100 spaces from the Canadian government. And so if one of your congregations feels called to support one of these refugees in need from Afghanistan, please let's not forget that before the Ukraine crisis, we had an Afghan crisis, and we shouldn't forget that there are people still waiting and desperately waiting, as there are many, many others in other countries. So thank you for your support for um, Ukrainians that arrive here, but at the same time, please also show your solidarity with other refugees that have been desperately waiting to come to Canada. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, David. Thank you especially for uh, mentioning the Welcome Angels program. It's a wonderful program um, and ministry being um, driven by or, uh, the Rhenish Church in Toronto, in Markham, um, and we're so grateful for that. Uh, the, the focus of Welcome Angels is helping congregations learn how to welcome newcomers into their communities, whether they welcome them as uh, refugees, whether they welcome them because they're people who have come to Canada that don't qualify as refugees, or whether they've immigrated. They're providing the tools for people to understand what it truly means to help integrate people into communities, including church community. So thank you for that work, David, and I'm looking forward to a further rollout across the country as we strive more and more to become a welcoming church. Thank you. Karin, I'm afraid that's all the time we thank have, you. and I want to thank you so much for your report. Please convey our thanks to your staff and to the board. You have our ongoing prayers for your work. And thank you very much for your support. Thank you so much, Bishop thank Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we're coming on to five o'clock, which is a time when we need to leave today. So I am going to move the next discussion item about the bylaw amendment to unfinished business tomorrow. We have lots of time tomorrow to do the work that we need to do. So don't fret. Um, and I am now instead going to um, call on, I, first of all, I want to remind you that we are very close to five o'clock, which is the deadline for submissions to reference and counsel. It's also the deadline for those bios for vice chair to come in. And now I'm going to call on Reverend Paul Gares to close this session with prayer. Um, we're going to end this session, recess as the National um, Convention, and then at 5 o'clock, after a little bit of a stretch break, we will reconvene as the Corporation for Lutheran Collegiate Bible Institute, LCBI. So, Paul, please pray with us. Uh, during this prayer time, you're invited to take a moment to reflect on the work of the Holy Spirit among us. I invite you to begin with a deep breath. To inhale what nourishes and restores. And to release what needs to be released. And then I'll share with you a reading from Romans and a creed that was first written for the youth gathering in 1994. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved, now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, 
For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes, the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We believe in God, in Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit, and in you and in me. We believe the Holy Spirit has freed us to worship as a community. We believe the Holy Spirit works through balloons and ministers, daisies and wiggly children, clanging cymbals and silence, drama and the unexpected, choirs and banners, touching and praying, spontaneity and planning, faith and doubt, tears and laughter, leading and supporting, hugging and kneeling, dancing and stillness, applauding and giving, creativity and plodding, words and listening, holding and letting go, thank you and help me, scripture and alleluias, agonizing and celebrating, accepting and caring, through you and through me, through love. We believe God's Holy Spirit lives in this community of dancing, hand-holding people where lines of age and politics and lifestyles are crossed. We believe in praising God for life. We believe in responding to God's grace and love and justice for all people. We believe in the poetry within each of us. We believe in old people running and children leading. We believe in the reign of God within us. We believe in love. Thank you, Paul. We are now recessed as National Convention until tomorrow at 11 o'clock Central Daylight Time. We will reconvene as the Corporation of LCBI in six minutes at five o'clock. At this time, we welcome those from the Board of Regents who are joining us on Zoom. And uh, please take this opportunity to have a quick stretch or a drink of water or what you need to do before we get on to the important work of LCBI. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. I'd like to call to order the um, corporation meeting of LCBI. I want to um, point out to you that the agenda for the meeting can be found in the bulletin of reports for the ELCIC convention in section C, page three. Now, approval of the agenda requires a vote on the motion that comes from the floor. So I'm calling for a motion to approve the agenda. Could you please signify that by using the raise hand feature in Zoom? It's moved, thank you, Prema. It's seconded, thank you, Deb, and thirded by Iris. Lovely. It is before you now, so I'm gonna call on a voting screen to come up. Is it just the display or do you have one? Are we getting a voting screen? Okay. 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 Sorry, we're letting the LCBI people in. That's good, they should be here. So we can stop the clock on the vote since we don't have that up yet. If this is the biggest snag that happens in the next hour, I could care less. <sighs> Do -do -do -do. All right, I see board members coming in. Hello, Laverne. Laverne, do you have a hand up for a reason? Oh, Murray also has a hand up. There I am. I can't, uh, I don't see a voting screen, so you're not seeing it either, I guess. Just be patient, everyone. This is coming. We used to see it when it was blank, but now I don't see it at all. Oh, Iris, I'm so glad your cat showed up. I was hoping for that. Don't tempt me. <laughs> yes, I could do my... <laughs> I'm inspired by Gurdip from the Yukon, who dances Bangra of joy every day. <laughs>
I'm sorry, folks. I, we really do appreciate your valuable time, and we appreciate the, your being patient with us while we sort out this technical issue. I'm sure it won't be much longer. Christina, do you have a hand up? Would I you like do. to address the group? Sure. Um, my name is Christina. I'm Kuhner. sorry, I can't hear you. Oh. Oh no, there you are. Oh, no. Hi, can you hear me? All right. My name is Christina Kuhner. I'm from the Eastern Synod. And while we're waiting, I thought I would share that in Hamilton, it's 27 degrees with a 37% chance of humidity. Uh, thank you. We could start telling stories about the hottest national conventions we've ever been in. Apparently the founding convention in Winnipeg was a real cooker. I also fondly remember the youth gathering in Halifax where the auditorium became known as the sweatplex. Yes. <laughs> Doug? Yes, uh, just a, one quick, uh, at some point, could you please make a quick uh, comment? Uh, since a lot of these are recommendations uh, uh, of issues that have been presented, and we're going to be reporting back to the um, ch uh, church councils and, and our congregations, uh, since these are recommendations and may have other ramifications, uh, what kind of details should we be uh, expected to, to give the full recommendation as they've been given to us? Um, are you talking, Doug, about the, parts, about the parts of the bulletin of reports that we're not dealing with this year? That's correct. Yes. Report on them, except to note that they're there and we'll be reporting on them next year. So, your discretion. Thank you. Okay, we have voting screens. Oh, we have a voting screen. That's wonderful. So if we could now have the ballot to approve the agenda, then we're off to the races. There it is. Please vote yes or no to approve the agenda for the corporation meeting. And I'm gonna shorten the time for the vote to one minute because I think we're anxious to get going. Bishop? Yes. There's a comment in the chat. If you aren't seeing this now, please refresh your screen so that you can have access. Bishop? The, the screen in the platform just got a little tired, so give it a little drink of water by refreshing it, and it will jump back in and show you the vote screen. Yes, the dashboard. I always forget that it's called that. The dashboard. How are we doing for votes? Okay, I think we'll call it then and we'll close voting and see the results of the vote. If it was something more significant, I would hang on. No, that isn't significant. So we'll see the results when they're ready. It is approved. Let's continue. 
You can find the minutes of the previous corporation meeting on the bulletin of reports C4 and C5. I'm looking now for someone to please move their adoption. Again, if you could use the raise hand feature in Zoom. They're moved by Audrey and seconded by Jennifer and thirded by Alana and fourthed by Judy. And Oh, Doug's in there with a fifth. Okay, they're before you. Um, are there, is there any discussion on the meetings from the last corporation meeting? Audrey, are you wanting to speak to the minutes? Tracy, are you wanting to speak to the minutes? No, okay. I don't see anyone wanting to speak to the minutes, so I think we're ready to vote on them. So if we can have that voting screen again. This is a vote to move adoption of the minutes. And it's just yes, no, please vote now. And again, we're going to try and limit this to one minute. And then I'm going to slow us down. Iris, do you have a qu um, Iris, do you have a question? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? To hear from Iris Schweiger. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. So can you yourself. hear me now? You need to unmute yourself. Um, I tried. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. As you. a new delegate who has not been at the last convention, am I allowed to vote on the minutes? Yes, you are, assuming that you trust the people who were there who are saying whether it's an accurate um, accounting of the vote. Right. Thank you. Thank you. We've had more than a minute. I'd like to close the ballot, please. And when you are ready, please display the voting results. They are adopted. OK, now we get past the opening business into the heart of the matter. I'd like to call on LCBI President Wayne Hove to present his report. His written report can be found in the Bulletin of Reports starting on page G1. Wayne, we're looking for you to address the corporation meeting. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, corporation. Good afternoon, delegates and convention. Um, I don't hear you yet, Wayne. Just hold on a second. You dump it in uh, Wayne you can go ahead now I think we've got it under control okay. sure thank you yeah good afternoon uh, delegates and convention and um, uh, bishop and bishops um, my privilege uh, to bring our short report here um, we uh, uh, have had just a, a, a wonderful year reopening uh, after COVID the excitement of and uh, much preparation for uh, in-person activity really played a huge role in having a, just just a great year, I have to say. It truly amazes me to see how um, 
the students bond to each other and to the staff. As the saying goes, we've been uh, watching our pennies and with support from uh, generous alumni, we're managing fairly well. Uh, the audit summary that you might be able to see here now is for the previous year, not this current last year ending this June, but the last year before, um, does show a fairly healthy net income. Uh, the current year's income is positive as well, but it's not going to be to the degree of this, uh, of that previous year. Uh, when you reopen, um, there's a lot more expenditures and we did burn through a lot of cash reopening activities and various events, um, but it is still positive. So it'll be the fifth year in a row now that we've had a positive side to our, to our in income. Uh, we've been able to restart a number of extracurricular activities and uh, return to a touring choir and an annual musical. Um, we booked Camp Kyriakos in Alberta and at different and then sang at different Lutheran churches in the area. Uh, we were at Rocky Mountain House, we were at Pinoka, we were at Red Deer, and we were at the camp itself and um, we just had a great time. The musical this year was a huge challenge uh, as the students took on Newsies, uh, complete with stage balconies and everything. It was just a very, a very strong year for our, for our students. So they, they just had a great time doing that. We grew uh, in numbers a bit last year with student numbers around 85. And we'll grow again this year, um, expecting around 90, 95, maybe 100 if all the applications are approved. Uh, but we'll see uh, sometimes there's later additions and later dro dropouts. So maybe 90, 95 in that area. As far as uh, capital projects, we also did a fair bit of maintenance and upgrade. We replaced all our boilers and uh, did some renovation to a number of suites and, and houses. Um, so the campus is looking, you know, fairly, fairly good this year compared to years in the past. Um, and in fact, we've started to consider with much excitement, finally replacing our food services building with a health and nutrition uh, center. Uh, we're in the very early stages and we're just completing a case study now. So uh, watch for updates as we move forward with our vigor and excitement to see where that will uh, lead us. Uh, I just can't say enough about our administrative team and our teachers. We believe in doing what we can with what we have and then calling on our Lord to provide the miracle of healthy relationships and support from our alumni and, and friends. Um, if you do want to sign in and uh, get some weekly updates, we do have uh, what we call campus clips and uh, you can contact alumni at lcbi.sk.ca and uh, you can get all our latest news as the weeks go by. Um, just in closing, I would encourage all convention attendees, uh, alumni and parents and grandparents to consider the option of having your children and your grandchildren attend our beautiful and loving LCBI this fall. Um, a, couple, a couple years ago, the valedictorian speech ended with this saying, go forward, show the world how we love and how we love here at LCBI. Uh, we have a beautiful, beautiful school and uh, we, we, we hope that your prayers will continue to flow our way. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that's my report for this particular year. Thank you very much, Wayne. I'm now looking for a report on nominations for the Board of Regents. I believe there's a slide. Can we make that a little bit larger? Okay, my, thank you. That's who currently the members are. Um, you can see the list there and um, seeing who has second terms and so on. Do we have a list of the specific people being nominated at this time? Here we go. So up for nomination, we need three lay members and they are Daniel Glesky, Kyle Halverson, Karen Meager. Ordained members, four to be elected, um, Reverend Reg Berg, Reverend Harley Johnson, Reverend Daryl Olson, Reverend Alex Parsons. So the question now is, are there any other nominations from the floor? 
If there are, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. I'm looking for any other nominations from the floor. And I'll call out for a third time. Are there any nominations from the floor? Seeing no one moving a hand or any other thing el anything else, I declare that those seven persons um, are acclaimed and elected as members of the Board of Regents going forward. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. So we now have a report on changes to the LCBI Act. And um, I know there is a slideshow to prepare to come up. And my understanding is Daniel Glasky has been able to join us and will be giving the report. We will be acting on a motion related to this after Daniel's report. Daniel, I need you to maybe raise your hand so you can get to the top of the queue. That'll help us find you to spotlight you. Oh, there we go. Oh, there you go. Okay, I'm just waiting for the slideshow to present, but this has been a process that has begun over a decade ago to kind of modernize uh, governance at LCBI. And uh, we come to the conclusion that we have to make some amendments to the legislation to go forward. So is the slideshow up? Yes. yes. Okay, I can't see it on my screen, so uh, at all. So um, I'm assuming it's on the first slide. Correct. Okay, so um, we'll go to the second slide, and this just gives you a kind of visual representation of the areas of the existing uh, legislation that established LCBI, the areas that we were targeting. We are going to be amending slightly less than half of the uh, of the legislation. Uh, major revisions concern membership, corporation meetings and officers. Minor revisions are simply modernization of some of the language and references, particularly with financial ones. So we'll go through the sections a bit by bit that, that we are changing. Next slide, please. The uh, revision, the uh, legislation was last amended in 1960, um, and our proposed revision essentially says the same things. One of the things that we wanted to change was the reordering of the priorities. If anybody here was recalls that uh, Luther College has also changed its its legislation, uh, we have gone through a similar process with internal review and out external consultation. But we wanted to reorder the, the uh, priorities of LCBI for the religious, educational, and recreational training of pupils in that order. Next slide, please. In Section 2A, Acquisition of Property, the only thing that we're going to be deleting is a whole bunch of provisions that were made in 1960 for uncertain reasons. But 60 years of inflation have created a bunch of shackles that we would like to remove. And uh, this would allow us to um, have unlimited ability to raise funds and to allow U LCBI to use its property as we see appropriate. So next slide, please. The other part that we're changing in section two is very similar um, and it has to do with what uh, um, to do with the debts and the same thing. We wish to remove some of the shackles that 60 years of inflation have put upon us um, as well as some terminology that was somewhat unclear to us uh, about uh, any certain debts and gifts being reverted to the crown. Next slide, please. In section six, we are changing some of the execution of instruments just to make reference that um, for signing authority is that the Board of Regents becomes the governing authority of the LCBI rather than the corporation at, its na in, at the national convention, which would only be every three years. Uh, 
Next slide, please. Section eight regards membership, and this is one of the big changes. Uh, membership formerly in the corporation was all congregations of the ELCIC. The way we are changing it, it essentially is, is that all congregations of the, any congregation of the ELCIC can still apply to become, to maintain membership into the LCBI corporation. Uh, but we are going to permit other Lutheran congregations. And then a sub clause also has individuals who are of any Lutheran congregation, which itself is not a member. This would allow um, alumni that uh, have scattered across even the globe, as they are members of any Lutheran congregation, is they can themselves become a member and stay involved in the governance of LCBI. Uh, section two is the corporation may grant associate membership according to the constitution and bylaws. This allows us to potentially expand uh, to become more ecumenical uh, in our uh, um, support and outreach and service. Next slide, please. Section nine uh, is where the meetings come in rather than the meetings at the national convention every three years now is that we would like to have an annual meeting. This allows the governance to be a little bit more responsive to year-to-year uh, -year needs of the school um, and uh, um, allows the governance to be somewhat separated from the governance of the national church itself while still maintaining ties with the national church. Next slide, please. Section 10 is the officers. And again, this is following a theme is that LCBI has is an autonomous corporation uh, and shall may, may be maintained as an autonomous corporation, but the officers rather than a president uh, who is the leader of the national church will simply revert to the chair and vice chair um, and secretary and treasurer of the board. This is to recognize that LCBI does act independently from ELCIC and that our offices are no longer tied with the offices of the ELCIC um, and clears up some confusion because we have president of the corporation and we also have president of the school. So by saying that the officer is the chair, this clears up some of the confusion. Next slide, please. Section 11 will be changed is that the um, board of regents becomes, um, has been, been de facto the governing body for LCBI. And this recognizes that fact is that the board of regents is the governing body that is responsible for the business of the corporation. Uh, that is the changes to the legislation that we are having in a nutshell. The details are in the uh, bulletin of reports. And uh, we can entertain some questions um, going forth. very much. Thank you. I will um, recognize Karen Stepko. Karen, unmute yourself, please. Uh, Karen Stepko, a roster delegate from Saskatoon. Uh, I had a question about the uh, acclimation of those seven board members. If this does not pass, would that affect uh, some of them? Because I know one roster delegate is a North American Lutheran Church pastor, and the other one is an Anglican Church uh, priest. But I'm not sure if it would affect them as much as we're in full communion with the Anglican Church. Uh, yeah, we've looked at that in detail, is that there had been some changes to the Constitution several years ago that allowed uh, members to uh, uh, not be restricted to the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. Um, and uh, the uh, um, associate members of the associate con member congregations can be elected to the Board of Regents. So even if this does not pass, this does not change the vote at all. Thank you. Um, Laverne. Hi. Yeah, I'm a member of the a lay delegate of the Synod of Alberta and the Territories. And I had a couple questions. One was just for clarity on the, um, the motion that we're passing. I think we're recommending, can you just clarify, we're recommending changes to the act. When you say the act, this is an act that's going to be then brought towards forward on the, the Saskatchewan government. Is that correct? 
That is correct. This is uh, uh, basically a motion of support for the recommended changes to go to the Saskatchewan government and uh, have them pass the, the, the amendments. Okay, so the actual approval is from, from them in the end. Correct. Okay. okay, and my second question then is, is this then the intent then that LCBI then becomes an independent corporation with, with before it was a school of, of ELCIC, is it still gonna be considered a school of the IC, ELCIC? Well, it still is, it, it, it has been an independent institution. It's just its governance has been entangled so much with the ELCIC. It still remains a school of the ELCIC, but it is not in the ELCIC. Um, and really, constitutionally, it hasn't been in the ELCIC. There's just been shared governance. So this is similar to, like, say, Luther College? Um, Luther College's changes, though, maintain ties with the ELCIC only through local congregations. LCBI, being an outlook, which is a small community, has to maintain a much broader outlook. And so we would encourage... Uh, you know, all ELCIC congregations to take a look at, at maintaining membership. Okay, thank you. Linda, Linda Erlinson. So I just want to understand fully, ELCIC congregations need to apply to be affiliated with LCBI? Uh, they need to register their intent um, in the draft constitution and bylaws. This would be a, um, a pro forma matter where uh, once the board recognizes their intent to become members, they would be members. Uh, the board as the governing authority would still have some screening authority about any other congregations that apply or any individual members that apply. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Daniel regarding his report? I see Kevin Wolstead. A question of clarification. So if we approve these changes and the act is passed, um, we would no longer at conventions convene as the corporation. We would just receive reports from LCBI. Correct. Thank you. Um, Doug, I see your hand up. Doug Rosman from uh, Nanaimo, uh, BC Synod. Um, just wondering what happens if uh, LCBI uh, does not uh, follow, for instance, the same uh, ethos that the ELCIC is direction that it might be taken? Um, we have in our um, proposed constitution uh, is that we have pointed to the confession of faith, which is identical to that of the ELCIC. LCBI from its very inception over a hundred years ago uh, had recognized that the um, students are to be expected to identify with the mission of their home congregations. And so LCBI would continue to support uh, students in their, in their um, affiliation and um, um, I'm looking for the word, um, I guess their, their, their involvement in the mission of whatever their home congregation is. LCBI is has many students who are, for, for example, are not even Lutheran, uh, and uh, but we want to have some sort of Lutheran framework in order to say is that this is what we can point to, this is what the school stands for, but we recognize that there's going to be differences among the student population. Of which a good number come from the ELCIC, so again, it's, we would recognize and encourage them and support them in identification with the mission of their home congregations. Are there any further questions? In which case, I think we're ready to go on to a motion that comes to us from the Board of Regents. Oh, sorry, Doug Schwerler.
Okay. I'm sorry, Doug, you're not. Yeah, I got it. That's fine. Oh, Thank you. Um, with the changes to, with the changes to wanting to accept membership outside of the Lutheran Anglican community, are you not in any way, shape, or form concerned that that may, in fact, um, cause some kind of divisions within the Lutheran Church and most more specifically the ELCIC, where memberships as, as a result may be dropped? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand your question. Okay, well, you have memberships from ELCIC congregations. Correct. Correct? Yes. Okay. So by suggesting that you are and the Board of Regents are willing to accept memberships outside of the Lutheran Anglican community, are you not at all at least concerned a little bit that the current ELCIC memberships might not appreciate that? Um, the, I mean, currently there are members who are not in the ELCIC right now. Uh, the o only extension would be to Anglicans for full membership in our proposed constitution and bylaws. Um, so it's, the membership is still going to be restricted to Lutherans. And we, you know, one of the things is that we, we want them to acknowledge is the statement of faith that's in uh, our new proposed constitution and is also in the ELCIC constitution. And that is going to be our reference point. Okay. Um, I, I guess I didn't quite understand that part of the, of it went, I guess it went by so quickly, but uh, okay. So then my concerns are you've, you've taken care of that. And furthermore is, is that only ELCIC congregations are granted basically an automatic pass into membership. Everything else will need to be screened by the, um, the Board of Regents. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. I'd like to get the actual motion on the table. This comes from the Board of Regents and does not need to be moved or seconded. It is we as the current members of the corporation known as Lutheran Collegiate Bible Institute, LCBI, a, support and direct the Board of Regents to petition the legislature of the province of Saskatchewan to amend an act to incorporate the Lutheran Collegiate Bible Institute, SS 1960 C90, substantially in the form as presented. Acknowledge that as a result of these amendments, we will no longer be members of LCBI. However, we recognize that any congregation in the ELCIC is eligible for membership as are other Lutheran congregations and certain individuals, and C, direct the Board of Regents to enact the Constitution and bylaws substantially in the form as provided following the amendments of the Act. So that motion is now before you, and we are open for discussion on the motion. Linda. There we go. Thank you. I speak for the city of this motion. I've been working with the governance committee for several years now, and these changes are absolutely needed in order to provide more flexibility for the school. So that you understand the process, we're not passing these changes. We're asking you to support, or we ask for us to support them. And it's crucial that we have the support of the current members in order for this to be presented to the legislature in the, in the fall. And then as long as it's um, passed in the legislature in the fall, the hope is that we'll, it will be enacted in the spring. So I speak strongly in favor of this motion and would ask you to consider the same. Thank you, Linda. Jane. Thank you, Bishop Susan. Um, I, I do think I speak in favor of the motion. I wonder if there are students at this time who would feel abandoned 
uh, by the severing from the ELCIC. I'm not sure of the makeup of the school at this time with 85 students and whether um, there are many or any from the ELCIC. Um, I'm not sure if that information is available, um, but I guess I would say I'm, I'm, I would be curious to wonder if there are people who would uh, feel like we are uh, abandoning the school by this motion, though I do support it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll come back and see if we can answer, get an answer to that later. Mark, Mark Jerry, I recognize you. Thanks, Bishop Susan. I uh, just wanted to share, uh, uh, I'm in support of the motion as well. As you know, Luther College went through this process in 2019, and we still enjoy a very positive relationship with the ELCIC, including having the bishops and other members of our corporation as part of our annual meeting. What it does do is it helps simplify the governance process in terms of the operation of the school. And so I'd support uh, the motion to help LCBI uh, move in that direction. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else wishing to speak to the motion? Wayne, can maybe you can answer Jane's question. Uh, yes, uh, thanks Jane for the question. Um, right now about 60% uh, and sometimes 70%, it's just sometimes there's a loose affiliation but are, are considered Lutheran and about half of those again are ELCIC. Um, but the way the school, um, operates um let me say we are a lutheran school uh i want to make that clear for sure and for many many years the interaction between students from elcic lutheran brethren calc um lcc have been have been very close um we really formed the bond around we would see jesus and not so much the specifics of the denomination. Um, but, but no, I, I would suggest not because we do, um, we do very much take a Lutheran perspective to everything that, that we do. I recognize Shay. Uh, Shay Belanger from the Alberta Northwest Territory Synod. I speak in favor of the motion. COVID-19 has taught us that things change rapidly in, in the world these days. Anything that makes um, an organization more able to quickly adapt to changing situations is good for the longevity of that organization. So I speak in support of the motion. Thank you. Are there any further speaking to the motion? I really don't wanna rush you now. So take all the time you need to think and to ask the questions you want to ask, because this is a significant action. Christian. Hi. Uh, I am unmuted, right? There, I, now you can hear me. Uh, my name is Christian Wold, a roster delegate from uh, Hope Lutheran Calgary. Uh, I, I'm in favor very much of this uh, this motion that allows for that greater flexibility that we're speaking of and meeting the challenges here. Uh, my question is is maybe belong to the last section, but to just a point of clarity about what it means for a congregation to be a member of the corporation uh, at general meetings then do congregations send representatives is that the the idea there that is correct oh thank daniel, you daniel do you want to add to that um yeah so the intention is is that by a congregational um membership is that the congregation will have a slightly greater voice than if individual members um than individuals who are members. So we want to give a little bit more weighting to congregations who wish to it. The other thing is, is that the ex expectations of congregations um, is some indication of support, whether this means advertising the school, sending monetary support, hosting choir events, whatever, but we do expect some, um, some degree of support of somehow from the, the member congregations. 
Thank you. So again, I don't want to rush you, but I'm going to ask again whether anyone else has a question or comment to make before we call for the vote. Karen. I, I do have a question, which probably should have been asked before the question was called but I'm not sure why they would continue to report to us if this passes, because he did mention that he would, they would continue to report, although we wouldn't be having these meetings. Similarly to what um, we do with Luther College, um, we allow for a good news report to come to our convention just to maintain uh, former, former ties. So there wouldn't be a business meeting, there may or may not be a written report, but we will allow the president or their designate to come and just tell us a little bit about the life of the schools, because there still will be many of our members who will be interested and have a history with the schools, with both schools, um, in terms of how they're doing and how their ministry is going. There was also a convention action about that a couple years ago when it came to Luther College making the decision that we would continue with that in the agenda. So that's why. Are there any further speaking? I don't see any hands coming forward, so I think we are at a time when we're ready to discern and vote. So I'll ask for the voting screen to come up now. So the vote is to support the proposed amendments to the LCBI Act, and it's yes or no. Please vote now, and I'll give you two minutes. I'm sorry, Harley, did you want to say something? Okay. Two minutes, so we'll add another minute to the clock when we're done here. I'm sorry, Daniel, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I, I'm not getting a voting screen for any of these. And I believe Murray hasn't gotten one either. You have to refresh your screen. I have I've been refreshing. Yeah, I haven't gotten the uh, voting either. Reg, are you trying to speak? I see, I haven't gotten the voting screen either, and I've refreshed too. We'll just pause the vote and leave it open for a moment. Let's just double check. Can I get a report from, oh, they're saying scroll down. You need to make sure you go down to the bottom of the screen, see if it's there. Because right at it, you have it doesn't initially show on the screen. You have to scroll down to it. See if that helps. Reg, do you see it now? No, Nothing. you still don't have a voting screen. Nope. I don't. I don't either. Daniel, have you scrolled down to the bottom to see if there's a screen? Yep. Is it I because don't we're board of, members of the board of regents, not delegates to the convention? They're still members of the corporation. 
There is a possibility if there is a possibility if your Zoom is not updated that it would not allow you to see this platform. So I hope you all have the most recent version of Zoom on. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask one more time for the tech people to take a look. Let's just take a minute and take a pause in voting. I have version 5.10.4. I see you, Catherine, and if it's the same question, I'm just gonna say, let's just wait a sec and make sure that the Board of Regents has a voting screen as well, okay? Just hang on. If there's something else you wanna say, Catherine, then please un unmute. Okay, just be patient, people. We have time. So, um, does anyone have a voting screen yet? Then I'm gonna offer two solutions to the Board of Regents members. Number one, if you're comfortable, I'll just ask you one at a time to raise your hand and I'll count your votes and add it to the total. Or number two, you can email your vote to, but I want us to all do the same thing. <laughs> you can email your vote to Linda and we could do them that way. It would be fastest if I could just do a roll call and, um, and have you vote. So I'm going to need someone help me because I don't know who all the board members are here. But Reg, I see you and you're voting which way? I'm you're fine with holding up my hand. Do it live. Pardon me? I'm fine with going live rather than email. Are you voting yes? Yes. It's same here. Um, I, I, I can Scott, hold up the hand. Can you register your vote, please? Can you unmute Catherine Scott? Or yes. Go ahead. You can hear me. I'm voting yes. Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Karen Meager. I'm voting yes. Thank you very much, Karen. Daniel? I'm, I'm voting yes to. Or who else is on the board that I'm missing? Murray votes Murray? yes. And Murray? Murray, can I call on you? Would you like to add a vote? Yes, I support. That's five. Kyle Halverson. There. Harley Johnson. Harley, are you there? I, I support don't see as well. either of Thank them, you. so I'm adding. Oh, there's Harley. Harley, are you? Yes, I support, thank you. Well, that's six more, thank you very much. Okay, so let's just take a pause. What I'm gonna ask for then is for the results of the others to be shown and we'll add six votes. So it has overwhelmingly carried plus six votes. 
Sarah, why not? Are you asking a question? I am. I just wanted to note that um, perhaps some people didn't vote like me because the voting was paused and we were expecting that the voting would be reopened again so we could place our vote. But I mean, it, I just wanted to share that with you from a process perspective. Thank you very much, Sarah. Are you okay with us proceeding since it's such an overwhelming majority? Certainly. Fabulous. Then I declare that the motion has passed. And to the Board of Regents, thank you for your hard work. And know that you have the support of the corporation as it exists and of the ELCIC and convention as you move forward. Wayne, did you wish to say something? Uh, yes, um, I just a, a big thank you to that governance committee and uh, in particular to, uh, to Linda Granger, whose uh, help was just immeasurable in getting this done. Um, she has represented the ELCIC very well. And um, I, 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 just, I just think it would have been a very difficult task without her. So a big thanks to Linda, thank you. Thank you very much. And I certainly echo my appreciation because I've not always been able to be at board meetings and to have Linda participate has just been a gift to me as well. So thank you. We've already dealt with elections to the Board of Regents because they have all been acclaimed. Is there any other business? Karen, your hand is still up. Are you wanting to raise something? Karen Meager? Okay. I'm going to call for a motion to adjourn, and then I'm going to close us with prayer. Jordan, you're moving adjournment, and Deb Roberts, you're seconding an adjournment. I'm just gonna assume that we're all voting yes, unless somebody quickly wants to jump up and down and complain. The staff are saying, no way, okay. <laughs> Then let us pray. Loving God, you continue to walk with us at all stages of our life. We give you thanks because of the way that you have walked with LCBI and the ELCIC as we have had this discussion over a number of years. We give thanks to the ministry of the school, to its staff and um, teachers, to the students, to the board, to its president, to everyone who has a hand in, in shaping that ministry, for the witness that they have, for the way that they continue to strive to see Jesus. We give you thanks because your Holy Spirit has shepherded us through this process. And we pray now for the Board of Regents as they make application to the government in Saskatchewan to change the act that they would have smooth sailing and receive support so that they can take away all this time they've spent on this matter and devote themselves fully to the ministry of the school and the welfare of its students. All of these things we pray with great thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Everyone, have a wonderful evening. Members of the ELCIC, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 11 o'clock Central Daylight Time. I'm not going to try and tell you what other times. I know it's 9 in BC and um, 1 in Nova Scotia. Figure it out in between that. And uh, Board of Regents, thanks so much for joining us. And we, our paths will cross for sure. Thank you very much. God bless you all and good night. Mia, yeah. you want to shut this down quickly? We're all done. You want to turn it off? Yeah. I'm at